today in the news, Ryan Fantana at the courthouse. Michael Cooper discusses complex corporate structures. We show you an excerpt from the Cecil Brown interview. And our team of legal analysis debate the Cecil Brown case. Now, to Ryan Fantana at the courthouse. Hello, I'm Ryan Fantana for the Carlton News Network. I'm here outside the courthouse where the trial for Cecil Brown, the sign of a wealthy Canadian family, is about to take place. He is facing charges of criminal fraud. These charges, these charges were brought forward after allegations by shareholders that Brown was siphoning money from operating corporations into his parents' holding company. The operating company, Western Press, recently sold their newspaper to another publishing company for $10 million. $3 million of this was paid as a non-compete fee. This fee was paid directly to Brown's personal holding company, in which he holds 100% of the shares. However, the shareholders allege that these fees should have been paid to them and to the holding companies rather than Brown directly. Brown has maintained that he is innocent throughout this whole process. However, a major setback to this case was that his longtime friend and right-hand man, James Pilpot, has agreed to testify in the criminal charges against Brown and to admit fraud on his own part. Brown was facing similar and perhaps more serious charges in the United States, but it was decided since his corporation was being operated out of Canada that the Canadian courts had jurisdictions over this issue. And now to discuss the significance of this case, and to break it down, I'm going to send it back to the studio to our legal correspondent, Michael Cooper, and to his team of legal analysis. Thank you, Ryan. Welcome to Cooper 180. I'm your host, Michael Cooper. Today we'll be discussing white-collar crime in the context of the case of Cecile Brown. Mr. Brown has been accused of numerous accounts of fraud and faces a lengthy prison sentence if found guilty. Today I will be joined by two legal analysts, but first I will explain the complex corporate structure involved in this case that allows for these issues to arise. So I'm just going to quickly explain to you the corporate structure Mr. Brown had set up. Uh, p and owned majority shares of uh, each of the subsidiary companies, Eastern Press, Toronto Press, Western Press and London Press. Uh, these four companies were the newspaper dis distributors and uh, they're also the subsidiaries. Uh, P&O, which was a publicly held uh, corporation, was uh, traded on the TS TSX, was controlled by another corporation, which was CNO, which is uh, also a publicly held corporation traded on the TSX. Uh, CNO held 25% ownership shares in uh, P&O, but 75% uh, voting shares in P&O. Uh, CNO is in turn controlled by Cecile Brown's uh, personal holding company in which he held 100% ownership shares. Uh, Brown and company owned 10% ownership shares but 85% voting rights. Uh, and then, you know, at the top here is uh, the, the pyramid of uh, Brown owned 100% of the whole corporation. Uh, the difference between uh, the percentages is that uh, each, each uh, each common each shares shares have different characteristics. So some shares might get our voting rights, and some shares might get our only ownership rights. So uh, even though Mr. Brown had uh, his ownership rights, ownership sorry, his ownership shares were really low, he held uh, power because he had uh, voting rights, and his other shareholders did not have those voting rights, so he had effective control. Uh, this gave Mr. Brown effective legal control over the whole newspaper operation. So the issue that arises from this is that uh, when uh, Mr. Brown decided to sell his uh, corporation, uh, his, uh, one of his subsidiaries, sorry, because he was losing company, uh, he sold uh, Western uh, Press to an uh, offshore company. Uh, he sold it for $10 million, but $3 million of that $10 million was allocated to Brown's personal holding company and $7 million was allocated to Western Press and the $7 million was divided amongst the shareholders in Western Press. The shareholders were not happy that uh, Mr. Brown did not share the $10 million with uh, the, the subsidiaries and uh, these uh, two holding companies. Uh, Mr. Brown's uh, you know, argument was that uh, this is a non-compete fee, that uh, since he owned uh, 100% of the whole conglomerate through his uh, holding company that uh, he should be paid that. And uh, this would be what we'll be discuss discussing today with my two legal analysts. But uh, before that, I'm just going to quickly show you an interview I had uh, with Mr. Brown uh, earlier this week. 
So, Mr. Brown, how do you feel about the allegations that you used uh, company money for your personal expenses, like uh, throwing in uh, extravagant parties for your wife? Well, you know, Michael, those are simply allegations. They have no real truth behind them. And until someone shows me some hard evidence that proves it, these allegations are false. So how do you feel about Mr. Philpott, your longtime friend and uh, business partner, turning against you? I'm obviously hurt by his actions. I think he got scared and intimidated by authorities and tried to cut his losses. Even though as far as I'm concerned, we were not doing anything wrong. I cannot speak on his behalf if, as he was a company CFO and therefore in charge of all the financials. So what is your response to the allegations made by shareholders that uh, by taking the non-compete fee that you essentially stole their money? Look, Michael, these allegations are completely bogus. Why would they receive non-compete payments if they have no say in whether or not we create another newspaper to compete with Western Press in the first place? That decision comes from the directors at the top, not from the passive shareholders. They have no say in the operations of this company. It's the decision that comes from the top which have been creating profits for these company for years. These non-compete payments are managerial fees which I am completely entitled to. You can catch the entirety of that interview on Friday night at 7 p.m. on Carlton News Network. Today we have two legal analysts that will join us to discuss the matter at hand. Uh, the concept of white collar crime and the case of Cecile Brown versus the USA. We have John Edwards that has joins us from the Carleton University, who uh, he's a legal professor there, and we also have. My name is Charles Wayne. Charles, we have Charles Wayne Real. that will join us. Uh, he worked as a, on the campaign of uh, John McCain, and uh, he's also a, he's also a Republican representative. Uh, to begin this discussion, I'm going to ask you a question uh, directed at you, since you're Absolutely. representing Mr. Mr. Brown. Well, I'm not necessarily rep representing Mr. Brown, but I'm here to defend the interests of private citizens and their adequate, adequate competition in the marketplace. Yes. You may continue, please. Okay. Uh, in your opinion, is Bro. this a crime? In my opinion? Hell no. I mean, the way Cecil Brown had this structured, number one, he owns this entire corporate conglomerate, as you put it before. He owns and controls, no, he doesn't own, but he controls CNO, PO, and in that respect, all the newspapers as well. Now, Mr. Brown started this company up back in the 70s. He's put endless hours of time and effort to get the company to where it is today. Now, these newspapers would not be worth nearly as much as they were without Mr. Brown's endless hours of effort. And the fact is, that three million dollars was paid to, to Brown directly because he is the only one who could have put another newspaper into the marketplace to compete okay, with but Western Press The question well. is, regardless if you think he's right or wrong, what do you think his uh, motivations were? and uh, taking that $3 million is enough dividing it with his shareholders. His motivation is, yes. Well, his motivation is in this situation is that he's entitled to that $3 million. So you're telling me his motivation is iron greed? I mean, come on, look at it. It's like $3 million. Like, what's really $3 million to this guy? It's really not a lot of money, $3 million. To the average show, I mean, yeah, it's $3 million. It's a lot of money, but to Cecile Brown, no. It's not a lot of money. He did this out of greed and he did this out of arrogance. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously not, okay, let's take your point. It's not a lot of money, but he's entitled to that small amount of money if we're going to put it this way. So you're telling me it's all about arrogance and he is assessed the oh, no, no, no. that he not, has. Not, not arrogance, not arrogance at all. Mr. Cecil Brown, he started this whole corporation, as, as, I, as I said earlier. This is a $3 million in managerial fees. Well, Which he's completely entitled. Okay, he started the corp. Where would he be without his shareholders? Where would he be without these people investing their well, money the is, the in his public operating these shareholders company? Are, these shareholders are passive. They have nothing to say with the operations of the company. This decision wasn't theirs at all. Can you explain what a, to us what a passive shareholder is? I, I, absolutely. For, for the, uh, the viewers out there. Now, a passive shareholder, they give money to the company. They invest money in the company so that the company may make managerial decisions such as this one here. 
an active shareholder, such as Mr. Brown, he will actually make the decisions for the organization that will profit it. The passive shareholders, let's put it this way, they're like children. How can you say Mr. that? Brown, where where Mr. would the corporation be without the passive shareholders? If, 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 oh, go ahead. And fair enough. Fair enough. My point is, where would the corporation be without the investment from the passive shareholders? You can't just neglect the passive shareholders because they're passive. Oh, but they still their investor hard-earned money into the company so, are entitled. So who is the real victim here, Mr. Brown? No, the no Mr. Brown isn't the real victim. Mr. Brown is a perpetrator of this crime. The real victim crime. here are the shareholders. There's but They're losing this the has not been dollars. This isn't a crime. This is not criminal. And as you were saying before, the interests of the shareholders are being looked at here. They're getting seven million dollars from the sale of this newspaper, which was brought up. But they should be getting ten million dollars. They shouldn't be getting seven. They should be getting ten. That's the whole for point. For sitting on their arses. And they're not sitting like those passive shareholders. They are. With this money that's coming, yeah, because they get this money that they're investing in the, in the company by sitting on their arse. So that's exactly how they get it, right? They don't go out there and work for it and invest it in something in the hopes of making more money, yes, but also with the hope of not being, this money not being stolen from them. Okay, next, Steel, next, next question, next question. I'll drop it for now. Uh, we know that he's, in, he's going to court because the shareholders think he's guilty. Um, but there seems to be a jurisdiction conflict here because he's a company in Canada and he's a company in the US. Uh, is this a better case scenario for Mr. Brown if uh, the case was uh, was in Canada or the US? Which one's a better scenario for him? Well, uh, what, what I can break down for you first is just the, the differences between the two jurisdictions. Now, in America, we have what you call vicarious liability. So essentially, any criminal action conducted by an employee of an organization, that action can be reflected by the head of the corporation. So in that sense, Mr. Brown could be found liable for his actions, even if, say, this so-called crime occurred at a lower level of the organization. Okay. Whereas in, in Canada, you crazy connects over here, uh, you have a, a delegation doctrine. So essentially, you have to place the, the mens rea and the actus reus has to be found at the head of the corporation to find that corporation liable. Mm -hmm. in, this, in this case here, it would be easier to find Mr. Brown guilty if he were guilty, which I'm not saying that he is, using the American structure. I'm saying he got lucky that it's in Canada. He would have been found guilty in the United States. It's not a matter of if he would have found guilty. I mean, just alone in the United States, those RICO charges would have got him, like, what, 45 years in prison? RICO. Can you explain to the public what these RICO charges are? Well, I mean, RICO charges are just charges for, you know, pattern of illegal activity. They don't have to really be defined by anything. A pattern, that's, a pattern of illegal activity. Yeah, and that's exactly what he did. It's a pattern of illegal activity. I mean, he breaches a fiduciary duty, misuse of corporate funds, mail and wire charges, corporate fraud. Well, what else can you call that? It's a these, pattern of illegal activity. These legal charges are brought against individuals such as mobsters. Are you saying that Cecil Brown is a mobster? Maybe. Maybe he's just as bad. He's Stealing money from people is okay. not what mobsters do. All right, but using using the doctrine of vicarious liability, um, we know that uh, it wasn't it wasn't just Cecil Brown that was acting alone. Uh, he had a longtime business partner, Mr. Phil, Mr. Phil, Phil Potts, yeah, yeah. Uh, who admitted to committing crime. Uh, will he be held as accountable as Mr. Brown using the doctrine of vicarious liability? Well, in the sense of uh, vicarious liability. As we were saying, if this was tried in the States, and it was found that Mr. Philpotts committed an offense in this case, which okay. he admitted to committing, mm -hmm. and we were trying to hold the corporation liable for his action, yes, in, in that sense, the corporation would be found liable. However, what I think the issue here is not really the corporation's uh, legal actions or their crimes, but the crimes, so-called crimes of Mr. Brown individually. So in that sense, we're taking it out of the context of corporate crime and looking at the individual himself. In this sense here, I'd say that Mr. Brown would still 
not be found guilty in the United States for these offenses because of the re reasons I gave previously, because these were simply managerial fees, was what it comes down to, is what it boils down to. I mean, you even have his right-hand man, his friend that's been his friend for, what, like 35 years or so, coming out, admitting to these charges, mm -hmm. and putting blame on Brown. I mean, you know, you can't have better evidence than that. But the fact is, Mr. Philpotts, he was the one in charge of the company's financials. And he's come up and a bit wait, fraud wait, from wait, it. Wait a minute, Brown owned 100% of a company that owned the whole conglomerate. He owned 100% shares, even though his right-hand partner was with them for 35 years. It was Brown who owned 100%. Don't you think he knew that something was going on? Don't you think he knew everything was going on in this a bit? Well, the issue here is, number one is no evidence. Number he, two. What do you mean there's no evidence? No, no, you have his right-hand no, man testifying. Oh, well, he can say whatever he wants to get off the hook here. He's essentially saying that he committed these crimes. Mr. Brown was not in charge of the financials of that corporation there. Mr. Philpotts was in charge of the financials for that corporation. And Mr. Philpotts, in this sense, could be held individually liable for his criminal actions in this case. But since his testimony against Mr. Brown, don't you think he had his own individual interests? Well, that's the thing. He's looking for a, a smaller sentence. Looking for a smaller sentence. And I mean, hey, why not, right? Yeah. Got to give incentives to these whistleblowers. Otherwise, how are we going to get people okay. like Cecile Brown in prison for defrauding shareholders? We need to get the defraud. We need word. enforcement measures to get people like this into prison and, you know, incentivize it to the whistleblowers, incentivize it to these right-hand men that know what's going on, you know? Give them lesser sentence in order to get the bigger fish. Okay, I have two more questions because uh, we seem to be running out of time. We have to go to the next Absolutely. Uh, commercial. Um, he's in court, but we usually notice that uh, crimes like white-collar crime, they don't get it as uh, persecuted to the extent as blue-collar crime do. Uh, do you think that law enforcement gap exists between blue collar crimes and white collar crimes? Since is it does a so, social class play a role in uh, in crime? I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not big on social class. I mean, his, Edwards, maybe you want to handle this one. Like here. historically, yes, it has. But you know, we're trying to change a trend here, especially mm -hmm. in this case. The way we stop this from continuing, this trend from continuing, is to deter. Right? We got to deter future perpetrators of crime like this and how do we deter by punishing these people by giving them harsh sentences okay. by putting them in jail for long periods of time and by making them accountable for the crimes that they commit we got to make it clear to these people that look you can't just take the money out of the shareholders pocket and put it into your own you just can't do that so would it make a difference if we allocate more policing uh, towards white collar crime because there's not a lot of investigation uh, toward that uh you know, that study. You know, but, but the I thing, mean, the thing is, I policing mean, itself is, is expensive. You're taking taxpayers' dollars and you're trying to police these individuals who... Yes, yeah, so we, we can't just focus on blue-collar crime. Oh, no, no, I'm talking about white-collar crimes. Look, okay, look, but, police here, this, this is completely different kind of enforcement for this, all right? Yeah. Police are ill-equipped to deal with these kind of issues. They don't have the training, they don't no, have the police, knowledge, but, uh, they don't have the say organizations that, uh, external organizations that will audit this. Well, I, I, I think mean, they should police themselves. I mean, save the taxpayers yeah, but they money. they can't police themselves. Oh, because the, you can, there's all types of accounting shenanigans that can happen within the corporate structure. That's, that's why let's we, not get into the shenanigans here. That's I mean, why we need the, some third party, exactly. individual, like, exactly. independent exactly. auditors. And, and, what, and what I'm saying, I'm, I'm not saying that they shouldn't get these independent auditors, but what I'm saying, is that the government should not be paying for this policing. This policing should come specifically from the organizations themselves. This but if you do it from the organization themselves, they're not gonna do anything. Oh, no, 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 we no. need the government to go in. Th this, why do you stop crime? Why do you stop a murder? Because it harms people. Why are we stopping these kind of crime? Because it's harming shareholders. And it's gonna harm the public because they're gonna be paying millions and millions of dollars more in taxpayer money to fund these government organizations, when instead we can get the corporations to say, you know what, you're going to put aside however much, 1%, 2% of their profits, however much money you want to allocate to these types of crimes, oh, wait, and you can say, you have to go outside and get a third party. Who in the corporation will be doing this? 
Would it be the direct demand, the board of directors? Oh, this would come, this would come from the board of directors. You got, you got to, yeah, I, I really feel confident having a person like Cecil the, Brown exactly. directing these, uh, these auditors to, I mean, well, I, can, can, at the end can of the day. offer them an incentive of like, oh, you know, you know, be on my part, like, you know, do what I want to do, and then I'll give you $10 million, I'll give you a million dollars, like, would they still out of the corporation? I mean, here what I suggest is an incentive for whistleblowers. Incentive for whistleblowers to come out, just like Phil Potts did, right? Mm -hmm. Give him a lesser sentence, get the big fish, right? Give him incentives to come forward. And a lot of these times, these whistleblowers, they want to come forward. They're just scared, you know? They're just scared that they'll be incriminated they're themselves. They're scared that they know they're lying, and he's ratting out Mr. Brown. He's not ratting out. He's, 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 he's in charge of their financial statements, for God's sake. He's ratting them out for the greater good. That's what these whistleblowers do. They come out. They and say what's going on. For the greater good, what, what would you define as the greater good? I define the greater good as the public interest. In this sense, the public is going to be paying for all of these legal fees. That's a public millions good is shareholders in the future. I'm, I'm, sorry, sorry, I'm just going to have to cut you off. Uh, we're going to head to a commercial and we'll be back with a discussion. New Old Spice Shave and Gel is newer than a fresh pair of socks. Newer, newer than, than a New, new Jersey. Jersey. Newer than a new mouse, baby. Newer than an unopened gift from your stepmom. Everything's stuck! Newer than the waffle iron that's inside me. Newer than the new solar panels that were installed on the roof. And I'm the newest thing there is. You're not as new as me. Mm -hmm. I have a son! What else is new? We're back at the uh, topic of discussion now. We're talking about uh, uh, the case of Cecile Brown, uh, as well as the concept of white collar crime. We're joined with uh, John Edwards and uh, Mr. Charles Wayne. Um, I just have another question uh, before we get out of here. Uh, who is the real victims here? Is it Mr. Brown? Is it the shareholders, or can it be the taxpayers? Because who's paying these legal fees? Essentially, I'm going to say there's two victims in this case. Number one, Mr. Brown and his reputation. He's a reputable businessman, and this whole entire case itself is going to drag his reputation down along with his family name. Second of all, and most importantly to our viewers out there, the taxpayers. This is a criminal case. I'm happy it's not going to be in the America and the United States because I wouldn't want my taxpayers to be paying for such a silly issue like this. It's going to go to the criminal courts and Mr. Brown has the means and in my, in my opinion the right to appeal this as long as it takes, as long as it takes for the court to come to the right decision. In that time, the public taxpayers are going to be paying for these legal fees all the way through. First of all, first of all, first of all, the reputation of Mr. Brown. Nobody did anything to ruin that other than Mr. Brown. Mr. These Brown these is a person. His reputation. These allegations are brought on by his fraudulent actions. If he didn't want his reputation to go down, he shouldn't have committed these actions. Second of all, in terms of the taxpayers, I mean, fine, we're paying for this, but I mean, there's got to be a certain, we got to deter future actions such as this. That's the end goal of this. We can't have people like this committing these actions. So yeah, we invest a little bit in this case, but this will make sure that little future bit. people... This, this is potentially worth hundreds of millions of dollars in legal fees. I wouldn't say hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, it depends how far it goes. I'm just saying, I'm as a taxpayer... Is, is, is it, was it worth it to to take this case to court because they're pretty much suing him for three million dollars in which they did not get? How much are the legal fees? Are the legal fees more than the money they would have received? And would that be a waste of time? Uh, to me, it sounds like a pure waste of time, but I'll let you take it from here. I mean, I'm just saying, I, I, I'm not even thinking about the legal fees here. I'm thinking about deterrence. That's what we're. I'm trying to get at here. We need to deter future actions like this. We, we, we can't have people doing this to shareholders. Mm -hmm. we got to stop this now. And if it takes a little bit of money, that's fine. In the long run, the shareholders aren't going to be losing money anymore. The taxpayers aren't going to be having to deal with it. shareholders aren't going to have any money anymore. Yeah, but wait, doesn't, doesn't Mr. Brown and uh, any other businessman own a fiduciary duty to the corporation? 
and isn't a corporation acting the best interest of the shareholders? Isn't what the whole idea for corporation is uh, set up for? Aren't they the real owners? Uh, to the point you're making, yes, Mr. Brown has a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of all of the corporations involved in this scheme here. Okay. In, in my humble opinion, he acted in their best interest. He's selling off by he's robbing selling them. Off and he's taking a reasonable, just fee, managerial three of three million dollars. Back to thirty percent. Is that reasonable? I don't think that's reasonable at all. They would not have had these newspapers to begin with if it wasn't for Brown's work. Well, well, why is he even taking his non-compete clause if he's trying to get out of the newspaper business? He's trying to get out of the newspaper business, but he's taking this money and be like, oh. Taking this to the I don't get back into the newspaper. Well, that's the thing. That's the whole point of him selling these newspapers. Uh, put, put it in Mr. Brown's perspective. I mean, he spent the entire, the majority of his life building up this newspaper structure, this newspaper conglomerate, as you will. Now, the newspaper themselves, the business is going down. So you're telling do, do you not think that Mr. Brown deserves some just reward for his hard-earned effort? You know what? I, I look at Mr. Brown and I don't think he needs any more rewards. You know, I think he has plenty of rewards in his life. I don't think he... I think he's benefited so from much, this newspaper so it's empire. Much greed. It's pretty much out of greed. Is that I mean, uh, greed is mean, like he's a, he's a, he's arrogance. He already comes from a wealthy family. He's already wealthy. You know, why does he need three million dollars? Well, well, but what I have to say... Not as much related to that, but the whole issue of this case, and the perspective of the shareholders now. The shareholders want that three million dollars that they believe that they were so just, they were so justified in receiving. However, the shareholders not only are they going to lose that three million dollars, but because Mr. Brown is the CEO of the entire corporate structure, the entire organization, they're going to be paying for his legal fees as long as this goes. So not only are they most likely not going to see that $3 million, they're going to keep losing money the longer this stays in the system. As long as this keeps going to the appeal courts, courts which I assure you it will if justice is not found at the trial court. So really, is it even worth it for these shareholders to bring this case up in the first place? Number one. Number two, the stock of the company. Investors are going to look at this, they're going to say, I don't want to invest in a company with such, with criminal allegations happening, with these shareholders and the CEO going at it, like, like, I don't even know. It's just, it's just not worth it. It's just not good business practice. The stock of the company will go down, and at the end of the day, the shareholders lose, they lose, and they lose. And so will the public. And I mean that just so speaks every, to so Mr. Pretty much everyone's losing. I mean, like going to jail, shareholders are not getting their money back. The company stock is gonna go down. So I mean, that just speaks to Mr. Brown's character. So okay. he's using the shareholders' whose money. Is whose fault is? Is this the shareholders' fault for bringing this case forward? No, it's it Mr. Mr. Brown's, Brown's fault, fault for, for committing these acts in the first place and trying to defraud but the wait, shareholders. Who's getting hurt at the end? Who's getting hurt more at the end? Is it Mr. Well, hopefully, Mr. Brown, when he goes to jail, that's the, that's the whole point of this. Hopefully. He's the one getting hurt, but yeah, hopefully we'll be communists by the end of the day, but I mean, that's not going to happen in America, and that shouldn't happen here in Canada as well. Now, like we were saying, the victims of this case, yeah, the shareholders, they're victimized, but this victimization never had to happen if they just accepted the fact that the $3 million were managerial fees for his hard victimization. Never should have happened if Mr. Brown didn't take that $3 million unjustly from the shareholders. I'm sorry, I just needed to interrupt you there. That's the, all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you for tuning, tuning in to Cooper 180, and uh, tune in next time. Oh, and here's Mr. Brown now. I'll try and get some questions. Mr. Brown, how do you feel about the allegations brought against you? No comment. How's your relationship with James Philpotts? No comment. Were your intentions to harm your shareholders? I'm innocent of all charges brought against me. Any further questions should be directed towards my legal counsel. This has been a production of CNN, Carlton News Network.